Hi again. Um, here is the second part for the series that I started last week, uh, where we are talking about how genomic genetics and DNA are used by forensic scientists and law enforcement to uh, solve unsolvable cases otherwise. So um, we talked about the basics of DNA and how uh, what different methods can be used to get information about DNA sequencing and fingerprinting last week. Um, and I will link that uh, lecture down below in the information so you can get to it. Today, we are going to go further and we're going to be looking at examples of cases that were solved using genetic genealogy, DNA profiling, or some other uh, mixture of those techniques. And it is going to show you how exactly this work is done. So just to remind you, genetic genealogy is the use of DNA profiling or DNA testing in combination with traditional genealogical methods in order to find relationships, uh, biological relationships between individuals. It could be between family members or long lost, uh, you know, friends, long lost, uh, not friends, long lost family members. Um, but also it could be between a victim or a suspect and uh, the perpetrator or uh, a lost missing person. So this application of genetics has been used by family historians because it, the DNA testing has become a powerful tool, which is quite affordable as well. So it can be easily uh, utilized for such cases. Um, there are many websites that contain lots and lots of data from hundreds of thousands of people uh, for DNA profiling. Uh, this includes Ancestry.com, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, and GEDmatch. All of these websites minus GEDmatch are actually for profit in a way. You know, they are you pay them money to test your DNA, you send them samples willingly, and they will provide you with that information, that sequencing information. If you don't allow them to share that to make your data public. They will not do so. They will actually hold it very tightly within them. They would fight tooth to nail um, for uh, giving up that data. So even if law enforcement comes over and says, well, we need this information, they will not provide it. GEDmatch, um, however, is an open source site. And you can put in information there yourself uh, willingly. So you can upload your DNA sequencing data that you have gotten from any of these other sites, right? That you might have paid Ancestry.com to get to your sequence or 23andMe. You use that information, you download that report and you upload that uh, report from those sites into GEDmatch. And GEDmatch then holds, that's the repository of all these sequences that have been willingly made public through this site. Um, so this is the one that can be easily searched through without any permission from anyone. And that's the one that many law enforcement officials will use to find matches between their DNA sequences from either their you know, victim or the suspects and to see if they can find matches between them. Um, so we are going to be going through exactly how to do this. Um, so the biggest thing that this is used for is for forensic investigators to look at identification for remains when they find such cases. Um, of course, they usually have some historical information about missing people in that area or, you know, um, maybe somebody had reported someone missing um, and then they find a body in that area so they can think that maybe that those are likely to be the person that was missing but they have to make sure of it. And they do that many times when they cannot identify it by just a picture. Um, they will do that by taking DNA fingerprint of the remains and then tying it to the family that has reported them missing or that they think might be uh, connected to those remains. Um, you can also find perpetrator of crime if they find DNA other than the victims and the body or in the space that a crime was committed, they can use that sequence of the possible suspect in GEDmatch and they can look for um, 
matches within them and look for ways to connect them to the uh, suspect. So most recently, this type of uh, genetic genealogy analysis was, you know, the not possibly the most recent as such, but most recent very visible case of this was in the case of Golden State Killer case. So we're gonna talk about how exactly it was used in that because um, this case had been cold for many, many decades at this point. The crimes that were committed by the Golden State Killer um, were mostly done between 1976 to 1986 during that decade. So as you can see that that's like 40 years old at this time, 30 plus years old. Um, and this man was, the police had linked those crimes, about 50 rapes and 12 murders from those times to the same culprit, but they had no idea who it was. Um, so the California law enforcement that was investigating the Golden State Killer, um, there was somebody there that had spent their entire life essentially looking for the person who had caused these murders and who had caused these rapes. It was a fascinating story about that one as well. Um, but eventually they had found, you know, they had the DNA profile of the suspected rapist and the serial killer. And they had, when DNA sequencing became common, um, they had uploaded that profile into the GEDmatch uh, website. And um, they did that using one of the intact web kit from one of the cases that were attributed to this murder. And once they found several matches related to that DNA, none of them were 100% matched, so they weren't the culprit themselves. These were 10 to 20 distant relatives from that uh, web search that they were able to look at. They started working with a genealogist, Barbara Ray Winter, uh, who was able to construct a large family tree using the information from that jet match. Um, sequence sites, as well as, you know, of these publicly available DNA sequences of these distant relatives, along with historical information about uh, where these people lived, what these people did, who they interacted with, and using all that information, they were able to create this large family tree. Um, the actual perpetrator of the crime was a former police officer. He was the main suspect after they did this. And, you know, which made sense because 1986 is when DNA sequencing started to um, become, you know, come to the forefront, started to get used. And now they knew that maybe something was going to uh, catch them, you know, help them. This was something that could help um, the investigators find him. So maybe that's why they stopped doing the crimes that they had been doing all this time. But, um even with that information that wasn't enough to obviously bring him to trial or to arrest him, um, the investigators had to go a step further and actually conclusively find his DNA that would match the DNA from the rape kit. And to do that, what they did was they acquired samples of DNA on discarded items outside his home. So now this becomes a little bit of a biological issue, right? Is it our ethical issue? Is it okay? to be snooping around somebody's house and are not inside, just outside in the garbage even, uh, but get DNA match from there and then use that information to you know, connect them. Well, at that time it was considered okay. There are laws now in place in certain states where that would not be admissible, um, admissible data or admissible uh, information unless the actual suspect had given permission to the police for them to do so, for them to take those samples from there, discarded or not. Um, but at that time, they were able to make that match. Uh, the process took several months again. And when they were able to make that 100% match with D'Angelo, he was arrested in 2018. Let's think about 1986 through 2018, it's 30 years later that that over 30 years later that this man was able to be brought to justice. Um, 
Now, the way they did that was doing sequence analysis of the entire genome, making fingerprints uh, from those sequences and for all the individuals, and then using that information to um, find the hone in on the suspect. Uh, the karyotypic information, however, would have only allowed them to figure out if it was a man or a woman who was committing the crime just by itself. You would need that sequence information on top of it to get the full information. Another cool uh, crime uh, case that we, they have been able to do, where they were able to, again, convict somebody about 30 years later, was the Grim Sleeper case. Um, then in this case, this person, or this individual, was believed to be responsible for killing at least 10 people between 1985 and 2007. He was arrested uh, again at, in 2019, um, even though police had DNA from the crime scenes for the longest time, for all this time, they were unable to make any match in the DNA, any of the known DNA profiles. Well, they found somebody, they had uh, picked up a man on a felony charge, and they found that that man's DNA profile was extremely similar, though not identical, so it wasn't, you know, the person who had committed these crimes, but it was somebody who was extremely similar DNA profile to the Grim Sleeper. That meant that they were a close relative of that person. So using that information, um, they also then combined it with circumstantial information about that area, about where that person had lived, who he had, he had interacted with, and they were able to identify um, that Lonnie David Franklin Jr., who was this uh, person who was convicted of felony, his father was the most likely uh, person to have been the grim sleeper. Well, again, this alone was not enough. They needed direct proof that, you know, with the DNA profile. Again, they were able to use uh, the so-called abandoned DNA from a piece of pizza that Franklin had thrown away from his car. And using that, they were able to make a 100% match to the Grim Sleeper's crime scene DNA and arrest him. So here is essentially what they were able to find. Um, so this is the suspect that was unknown at that time. They had their biological evidence from crime scenes available to them. That genetic profile, when put into the DNA database, was not able to be to find anyone on JEDmatch that was similar. However, when they found this other guy, this convicted suspect, convicted felon, and they uploaded its genetic, his genetic profile into the database. Suddenly, they were able to see connections between this convicted felon and the DNA data they had from before um, of the Grim Sleeper. Now, those were the beginning of the investigation in that case. And then through further investigation, they were able to get uh, the to the Grim Sleeper with the abandoned DNA matching 100% to the original crime scene. Um, another third case is that of Tanya Wen Kullenborg and her 20-year-old boyfriend, Jacob, who were explained in November of 1987. Um, they found DNA from the killer on their, uh, on the, at the crime scene and around the bodies. Uh, they used that information. They sent it to Parabon Nanolabs, which is another company that not only uh, is able to look at genotyping data for the typical fingerprinting purposes, but they can also create a possible figure of that person, uh, of their lookalikes, you know, based on the scientific information present within the sequence. So using the uh, lab, the Paraba Nano Labs information, they were uh, able to create a image of what the killer might look like based on the traits that were within the DNA sequences in the genetic code. And that digital file from the crime scene was also uploaded into JetMatch, where they were able to find two of his relatives. Um, now there's another genealogist, C.C. Moore, she was able to take that information 
she was able to do some research into their life and she was able to find develop two family trees um that carried over uh, you know that uh were made through these two relatives and based off of that she was only able to find one male carrier in all of those that was a possible match to the suspect because there was only one male in that uh, in that generation where they were looking at in that particular place where they were looking at and then based on that they found in on Talbot because he was the only one there uh, that could have made the possible match um, they Decus had his house under surveillance, and at one point, uh, they noticed that a paper cup fell on the road from what he was drinking coffee in, and they were able to match the DNA from the paper cup again in abandoned DNA case um, to the profile from the crime scene and able to convict him for that. So here is an example. This is what we call reverse genealogy where you have the DNA collected from the crime scene um, that you don't have a 100% match with. But when they run it through the Jedmatch Bank, they were able to get two second cousins out of it. They will then had to go back and look at historical information to create a family tree. So they were able to get, you know, so this these two cousins were the ones that they found on Jedmatch. When they built those trees back, they found the maternal, maternal great-grandparents and paternal grandmother through that. Um, following through when they made uh, the family tree, um, these cousins did not have any siblings that they could attach them to, and they weren't 100% match. The only uh, part of the family tree that matched contained only one male. So that was the only suspect then. Um, they then collected his DNA from a discarded cup, and that matched 100% to the actual killer. So it's pretty cool. It's how the new kind of, you know, forensic investigations work. So these are the new Sherlock Holmes strategies, not the old ones. Um, with, combined with the old ones that are able to get us to our suspects. Um, so not all ca cases require that you have the entire genome. Sometimes it's not able, you know, you just don't have that capacity. You don't have the ability to get the entire genome. And uh, at the end of the day, when we look at our DNA, 40% of our human genome is repetitive DNA sequences anyway. And those are present in these little clusters called satellite DNA. So when we break our DNA up using specific enzymes, specific cutting enzymes, we are able to get these smaller pieces with these restriction enzymes and able to count, look at the length of these sequences and see how many variable repeats you have around the genome in different places. Some of these are clustered at very specific locations, so we know where they are and we can look for them very easily. Um, in these tandem repeat type conditions, uh, we use those areas that we can very easily find and sequence and examine. Uh, not even sequence. All you have to do in this case is just cut out that piece and see how variable it is. Um, now, this is going to be unique to each person uh, many times. And if you look at, you know, um, multiple ones, one of them, sure, multiple people can share that number of repeats. Two multiple people can share the number of repeats but if you have a bunch of these that you're looking at, uh, it's less likely that everyone's going to share the same number of repeats at all those variable sites. And in fact, um, it has been found that if you look at about 13 areas along the genome for this, then you are going to be pretty much in a one in a billion situation that no more than one in a billion will have exactly that same profile. And that's what we use in some cases to create a DNA fingerprint. Um, it allows us to make unique profile of our DNA. So there are several different types of these genetic markers that are present along our genome. Uh, one of them is called restriction fragment length polymorphisms or RFLP. 
Another one is simple sequence length poly, uh, polymorphisms or SSLP. Uh, then we have rapid amplification of polymorphic DNA, RAPD, rapid. And then we have several types of variable number tandem repeats. This is the one that we're going to be focusing on, VNTRs. They come in many flavors. You can have small, simple sequence, uh, repeat sequences uh, in SSRs. You can have single nucleotide changes, just one letter changes now called SNPs, and then uh, short tandem repeats, small sequences that are repeated multiple times, or SDRs. So when we are looking at these type of things, and first example I'm giving you is from a restriction fragment length polymorphism. So you can have a site where you have the normal version of the gene, and then you have might have a diseased version of the gene where that particular area contains mutation in a way that a restriction site is destroyed. So if you had the normal restriction site, normal cut sites with sequences, exact sequences, this fragment would, this one area of the genome would make one, two, right? Two different uh, bands, give you two sec uh, fragments from that one place. And if it is has lost of that site from one area, then it would only give one large fragment. And that's what you see, that you have the normal sequence that is uh, giving you two fragments, and then the disease that is giving you one large fragment instead of two smaller ones that would add up to this. Um, so this is one way that you can differentiate whether your particular site is intact or not. Uh, and then the second one that we're going to focus on is the variable number tandem repeats, VNTR. This is used for personal as well as parental identification, mom or dad, specifically for paternity. Um, these are repeats that are inherited and people will differ in how many repeats are present. Children and parents will many times match the number of repeats in most sites although it will change with as you go through generations over time. There are two different types of VNTRs that we use in forensics. One is called microsatellites, and the other is mini satellites. Microsatellites is what you will find in the combined DNA index system uh, used by the forensic uh, investigators. It uses 13 unique short tandem repeat sites and four nucleotide differences for uh, forensic purposes, they are present along all over the genome. One of them is AML site. This is used to identify whether the suspect or the, you know, um, victim is male or female. And the remaining 12 are used to uh, identify, create a unique fingerprint for that particular individual. And that's done using mini satellites, short tandem repeats, and simple uh, sequence repeats. So in this case, again, here are examples. We go for places that we know exactly where they are, not those where there might be some variation of their starting place. So when you look at that, you have, for example, in this particular short tandem repeat, you have one of your copy having four repeats, another one has eight repeats. You're gonna use a primer outside. Primer is just a little tag essentially to know when to copy, where, which section to copy. This little space we are gonna have right outside of those tandem repeats. These are the known spaces that we were looking at and we will copy them. Now, obviously the person who has just four repeats is gonna give a smaller fragment size than person who has the eight repeats. They will get a bigger tandem, you know, bigger fragment size. And so using these for multiple sites, you can create that unique fingerprint. Um, the, another way that we can be looking at these is amplified fragment length polymorphism. It's very similar to what we were just looking at. But in this case, we are looking for places where that a particular version or flavor of the polymorphism of the sequence is present or not. If it is, it's going to give a peak. If it is not, it's not going to give you a peak. Using something like this, using this type of DNA fingerprinting analysis, 
In June 2008, a 19-year-old was arrested for careless driving. Um, I don't know what the condition was. I don't know what the situation was, but somehow they took a swab from the inside of his cheek to create a DNA profile from this individual, and they uploaded it into a DNA database. When they did that, it flagged it as a close, but not 100% match to a profile of a probable killer um, of another individual, uh, Colette Aram, who was a 16-year-old trainee hairdresser who was abducted, raped, and killed many, many years, five years before this particular individual, 19-year-old, was ever born. So they obviously could not have been the ones who did the crime. It was somebody else that was close to them, familiar. And so it turned out that uh, eventually that the careless driver's father, again, Paul Hutchinson, was the one that had uh, committed the crime and was charged with murder. Now, Hutchinson DNA profile, um, they had the suspect's profile from cells that they recovered from his sample that they recovered from the car. Um, and, but again, they didn't have Hutchinson himself's profile. To do that, they were able to do familial testing and confirmation of Hutchinson DNA and then compared it to the one generated from the crime scene. Another example of this uh, type of fingerprinting used in forensics is Colin Pitchfork. Um, in 1980, they became the first person to be ever convicted of murder based on DNA fingerprinting evidence. So exactly this technique that we just talked about. Um, he was found guilty of raping and murdering two teenage girls in England. Um, now there, again, DNA analysis was used to link pitchfork, resulting in a conviction. So here's an example of what that might look like. This is an completely random sample, not from Pitchfork or in any other case like that. Um, in that case, you have the profile from the crime scene. Now your suspect's profile in this case, when you're using DNA fingerprinting, has to match 100% to the crime scene. It's all or none. So even though some of these bands may be present in multiple suspects individually, all of the bands have to match 100%. So when we do that, it looks like suspect two was the person who committed the crime because they match 100% to the crime scene, while others only partially match to the crime scene. Another reason that we, uh, another thing, application of this is paternity cases. So here you have an example where you can um, tell that the alleged father was not the father. Uh, so you have the mom there. Here you're showing just one of the little sites. You're not showing multiple sites. So the mom has at that one site two alleles, one from her mom and one from her dad. So that she has two variations. She would have passed one of them to the kid. Here's the child. So the kid does contain that same one. The father has a different version of the gene that is a little bit, you know, slightly different in size, right? You see that hair um, that was not passed on to the child. And the father does not contain what the child contains for the second location, which means this could not be the father. You always run a mix of all of the samples to see when there are two bands that are very close together, right? Like here exactly how they might show up. So here you have one where it was the alleged father was indeed the father. You can see here again is the mom's DNA. She has two different versions of the gene. Here's the dad. He has two different versions of the gene. The child contains one that matches the dad, one that matches the mom. So in this case, this would be the dad. So finally, um, we're going to talk about the Doe Project. The Doe Project uh, examines uh, bodies of young individuals that might be victims of incest or rape that they find, that they are unable to find their, you know, who did the crime. And they put the profiles available from these individuals on JetMatch to try to find the victims. 
identity themselves. And if they have other information on their other kind of DNA on there, then they can use that DNA to find the suspect uh, who committed the crime as well. The first success story of that was in 2018, where they were able to identify the dead buckskin girl in Ohio um, as belonging to Marcia King. So they were able to identify the body, um, that the body came from Arkansas, you know, from an individual in Arkansas. And in this case, they have been able to identify many, many, many um, dead adults or missing individuals. <laughs> they can also use this. This is another software called Snapshot, similar to what we talked about with Nanolabs. Um, they can use these uh, the DNA that they find to construct a description of the individual when they are unable to find a match for them in order to look at that picture uh, you know, send that picture out and see if somebody comes forward as possible family member for that individual. Uh, so using the DNA profile, the genetic code that is present there, they can come up with a lot of information about them regarding whether they're male or female, what skin color, eye color, hair color they might have, whether they might have freckles or not, uh, their general body structure, you know, their uh, ancestry. A lot of information can get be gotten from DNA alone. In addition, usually for facial, facial reconstruction, they use a combination of that DNA profile as well as a forensic artist who can solidify the shape of the job based on the bones they look at, they find to make the reconstruction more real. Uh, so the DNA phenotype typing can, you know, only give you normal variation in appearance, skull evidence, and other things are needed to make the full uh, face that is uh, more close to the real thing. So the final blended snapshot is your composite then. Um, nowadays, in addition to the DNA uh, profile from the nucleus, the typical DNA profile and the mitochondrial DNA, uh, we have new ways to examine DNA as well. These are called, or new ways to examine hereditary as well, and these are called complementary methods. Um, so you can use what we called RNA profiling for something like this, where they take messenger RNA markers that can be seen in saliva, semen, vaginal secretions, any kind of biological fluid when DNA is not available. They can use that and they can start examining those to mark a person, extract information about a person's ancestry, are about their genetics as well. Um, so it, they can find information uh, from that when they have no DNA available. And that's, you know, an addition application of this. So ethical concerns, obviously, as we talked about, you know, the biggest is the privacy of victims and the assailants. When they haven't given DNA consent for use of their DNA, what happens? Um, is it okay for the law enforcement to come and collect it from the garbage outside, from discarded cups by you while they have you under surveillance or do they need a warrant for this? Um, so now there are states where it is now a law that they have to take uh, the verification DNA with a warrant. They cannot do it without a warrant. Uh, and then what about you know, in future, what about, it's something already coming into play in many cases, but what about genetically modified babies where genetic information comes from more than two parents? So there are cases where there are a lethal mutation on the mitochondria of the parent of the mom that doesn't allow her to carry a baby viably, but they can do test tube, um, you know, IVF like procedures using a donor egg where they use the healthy mitochondrial DNA from that uh, donated egg. They use the DNA from the actual mom and dad to make the baby otherwise and then merge it together. So this is a condition where you have more than two parents. Um, so what happens then? How would that change DNA profiling and DNA uh, fingerprinting in that case? These are just some things that are to be thought about over uh, as we develop this technology further.
next, as a conclusion, um, we use genetic markers such as the variable nucleotide tandem repeats uh, for identification purposes. We use a technique called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, along with that karyotyping to study these minute amounts of DNA samples that we find at the crime scene. Um, you can have short tandem repeat analysis of 13 sites in one gene to create a unique DNA fingerprint, which can be then compared against CODIST or similar databases like Gen GEDmatch. Um, if you have really damaged DNA, we can use mini SDR and SNP analyses, or we can use mitochondrial DNA analyses to find useful bases of identification. Um, if we have uh, enough information in our database from similar ethnic group in unadmixed populations, and then obviously we can use DNA from the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, and RNA profiling to add on the information from what we have available at the crime scene to get a better identification, easier, quicker identification as well. So these type of genealogy analyses uh, done by genealogists and forensic scientists are bringing justice to criminals even after decades have passed, right? So this is a great way for us to make sure that no one is above justice and everyone, every victim is able to be identified and uh, is able there, you know, uh, whatever happened to them has been, uh, the person perpetrating this crime has been found and given uh, the chance for those who have been left behind to have some closure on that horrible experience. So that's all for today. We'll talk about something more next time. Let me know in the comment section if there is something specific about genes and genetic analyses that you would like to know further in the next lecture. Take care. Bye-bye.